Welcome once again to Mises Weekends. I'm your host, Jeff Dice. And this weekend, we are talking about the alt-right and the socialist left and what both of those emerging political forces might mean for libertarianism in 2016 and beyond. I actually gave a speech on this very topic about two weeks ago at our Mises Circle event in Houston, and I got quite a bit of feedback on it, as you might imagine. I got uh, alt-right people telling me I, I don't understand the alt-right, and I got some uh, Bernie Sanders progressives telling me I don't understand uh, the left. So I thought it would be good to extrapolate a bit on my talk and answer perhaps some of those criticisms or questions about it. Now, sort of underlying all this is this notion that the libertarian moment has passed, right? Uh, Rand Paul didn't do as well as a lot of people hoped, and there's been some events around the world, the rise of ISIS, uh, terrorist attacks, the immigration and refugee crisis in Europe, the uh, shootings at the nightclub in Paris. So the mainstream media is telling us that, well, you put all this together and people have just sort of gotten over this uh, non-interventionist, isolationist libertarianism, and that it's peaked perhaps with Ron Paul in 2012 and that it's had its day. Of course, I certainly don't agree that the libertarian moment is over, and we'll get into that a little more here as we progress. But I will say that I don't see libertarianism per se as a political movement, and that I see political movements generally, as, at least at the national level, as not only a waste of time, but actually counterproductive to what we're trying to do in terms of winning people's hearts and minds and, and hopefully separating and segregating us from this beast of a federal government. But What's so interesting about what's happening, I think, this year is that we're really starting to see that this great lie, this great myth that there's a democratic consensus that can be reached in America is being laid bare. And social media does so much to make this apparent to us, right? People say things on social media. People say things in Internet's comment section that they would never say to each other face to face. So in many ways, for the first time in human history, we really understand what other Americans think of each other in a way that we never did before. You know, in the past, maybe if you got really angry about something you saw on a, in a debate, a political debate, you sent a letter to the editor of your newspaper, a physical letter, and maybe that got printed or, or maybe it didn't. But now we have this sort of instantaneous stream of consciousness commenting. Um, and I think it is very healthy in the sense that it's allowing us to move past this notion that we can all decide things on some mass democratic basis because we can't. And I think we're seeing this breakdown even in mainstream media. You know, just this this past week, we've had two articles, one in The Washington Post and one by Mona Scher and everyone's uh, favorite neocon, just absolutely unhinged at the Trump phenomenon. You know, the, the idea that Trump could win a majority of, of electoral votes to become either the nominee or even the general election winner in the fall has got neoconservatives so bent out of shape that it's interesting to watch. I don't care what you think about Trump, pro or con, but elites like Mona are actually starting to exhibit in public what they really believe, which is that they don't believe in democracy. They never have, right? Elites only believe in democracy when the right candidate wins. And we see this time and time again. We see this in domestic politics, and we see this in foreign policy, where lowlifes like John McCain will support a revolution and say, well, this is democracy in action, when the, uh, the, the Washington, D.C. foreign policy establishment's candidate wins the supposedly democratic election in country X or Y or Z. So, again, I think from the libertarian perspective, the idea that the myth of democratic consensus is being blown up is a healthy thing. And I'm not just talking about a scenario where one side or the other loses and says, well, the other side engaged in electoral fraud like we saw in the Bush v. Gore debate in 2000. And we're now talking about one side just saying, well, because of campaign finance rules, uh, you know, special interest money can kind of buy elections and the real democratic will of the people is never really shown at the ballot box because, you know, their message is suppressed or another message that is better funded prevails. That's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about a situation where millions of people in this country, ordinary people, simply will not accept it if Donald Trump becomes the president of the United States. And millions of conservatives in this country simply will not accept it as valid or legitimate if Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton becomes the next president of the United States. People have actually gotten to the point 
where they understand that just because the other side is able to garner, you know, 51 percent of voters, not of, of the population, but voters, you know, that doesn't make the resulting government legitimate. Right. Why should anyone be governed by someone they hate whose policies they disagree with and whose supporters they don't like? Right. Well, it's a perfectly valid question. The answer is nobody should be governed by such a person. And there's no political or legal theory that has ever been forwarded that answers that question. And I include in that so-called social contract theory. Right. There really isn't a good answer to that question of why should I be governed by someone I hate simply because that candidate was able to get a tiny majority of voters. And look, as libertarians, you know, we understand the dangers in this breakdown of democracy, right? When the great questions of a society are no longer decided by politics, well, there's two ways that society can go. One is that it can devolve into authoritarianism, but there's another way it can evolve, and that is to a more libertarian society, a society where the great economic and social questions of the day are no longer decided by the state or they're decided by the state less often or less frequently. And to me, that's my definition of a libertarian society where we don't decide things politically. So in that sense, I think we should applaud what's going on with this sort of division in America. But I do think as libertarians, we should celebrate the death of the democratic myth. And I think as libertarians, we should be fundamentally opposed to democracy because it in itself is fundamentally incompatible with human liberty. So one last point on this democracy issue, I'll leave you with a great quote from Hans Hermann Hoppe writing in his book, Democracy, the God that Failed. Of course, Hoppe makes the point that uh, democratic mechanisms are a disaster both economically and morally. So quoting Hoppe here, he says, democracy promotes short-sightedness, capital waste, irresponsibility, and moral relativism. It leads to permanent compulsory income and wealth redistribution and legal uncertainty. It is counterproductive. It promotes demagoguery and egalitarianism. It is aggressive and potentially totalitarian internally vis-a-vis -vis its own population as well as externally. In sum, it leads to a dramatic growth of state power. Democracy is doomed to collapse just as Soviet communism was doomed to collapse." End quote. So I think that pretty much sums up everything I have to say or feel about democracy. So that's the good news is that the death of the libertarian movement has been overstated and that the faltering state of American democracy is something to be celebrated. But as I said, much of my talk in Houston was devoted to talking about these two forces that seem at odds with each other, um, the progressive left, the, I will say the socialist left versus this newly emerging alt-right phenomenon. So it's fun and it's interesting and I think educational to talk about both of these forces and understand them a little bit. So. What is the new progressive left embodied by the Bernie Sanders phenomenon? Well, you can find it in places like Black Lives Matter. You can find it in places like Occupy Wall Street, Democratic Underground, uh, Salon.com, uh, Feministing.com, another website. And I think to understand today's socialist liberal, today's progressive is, of course, how they turn themselves. Um, you really have to use the term social justice warrior because that's at the heart of today's progressive. This is not your parents or your grandparents' democratic left-wing politics from a few generations ago, which was much more focused on money and economic issues and union power, that sort of thing. Today's social justice warrior is almost completely focused on identity politics, right? Identity politics and social justice is at the heart of the Bernie revolution. So every issue from the social justice warrior perspective has to be viewed through this filter of sexism and racism and homophobia and privilege and transgenderism, et cetera. And so America's past viewed through these filters is ever and always shameful. And hence, we have to progress past that old bourgeois America into a new, uh, greater society, right? So that's really at the heart and the mindset of socialist Americans today. And of course, the socialist left it believes in internationalism and global government. They love the UN. They love the IMF. They love the World Bank. And, and ironically, of course, they call themselves Democrats, but they hate localism. 
They hate secession. They hate actual local control where things are most democratic. And of course, they hate the marketplace, which is the, the only truly democratic mechanism we have in the world. Uh, on foreign policy, your left progressives will tend to be a little less bellicose, at least in rhetoric, uh, than neoconservatives. You might call it sort of a Peace Corps foreign policy, but they still believe in meddling. They still believe it's the, the role of the United States to spread democracy. Maybe your typical Bernie voter would like to see this done more with foreign aid or with um, NGOs and that sort of thing, but they're not really against uh, guns and butter. And, and we've seen this in the disappearance of the code pink types uh, who who were so busy uh, when W was still president, but who went strangely silent during the Obama administration, because at the end of the day, they're not so opposed to wars when Democrats prosecute them. On monetary policy, Bernie likes to talk about the Fed, so I'll give him credit there, but he doesn't understand it and he's mistaken about the harms it does. He has a dim awareness, and I think social justice warriors have a dim awareness of how the Fed creates inequality, but they don't understand that what we need to do is get rid of the political control of money altogether and return money to the marketplace and let money operate as a commodity. So they certainly don't understand that. And Bernie has actually shown that he is a bit of a greenbacker. He's hired a professor who's behind the modern greenbacker movement as one of his economic advisors. Now, on economics, of course, the progressive left is completely socialist. They believe in outright, if not de facto, nationalization of whole industries, education, energy, banking. Uh, of course, they believe in vastly increased uh, amounts of welfare and entitlements to give us more of what they would see as a just European style safety net. They believe in outright wage and price controls, and they're open about it to their credit. They believe in guaranteed minimum income, which unfortunately some libertarians have adopted as well. Uh, they also believe in income limits, something they're very open about, that no one should be allowed to make more than X dollars per year. They are, of course, entirely animated by the notion of global warming and that government ought to have overarching policies to prevent this calamity that's coming from the earth overheating. And to that end, uh, most progressive socialists actually believe in banning fossil fuels outright. And of course, free speech is not a cornerstone of the new left in America. On the contrary, uh, a significant number of Democratic voters in this country would vote and would advocate criminalizing certain types of hate speech and banning it. And, uh, you know, on the non-governmental quasi-private level, like media outlets, Facebook, et cetera, they certainly work very hard to suppress conservative and libertarian speech with which they disagree. And we're seeing that, uh, you know, unravel today in Twitter, for example, which is using different algorithms to uh, sort of dampen the voices of conservatives and, and the alt-right and libertarians. So the final point I will make about progressives, about today's socialist left in America, is, is very interesting because it's something they actually share with the alt-right, and that is that the left is not seeking consensus with you or anybody else, okay? They're not trying to win your vote. They're not trying to engage you in some intellectual debate and win you over. Um, they're interested in federalizing, or better yet, globalizing all decision-making with or without popular support. So the left is very comfortable with the idea of using uh, executive orders, of using the, ju the judiciary to accomplish things through judicial activism, which they cannot accomplish at the ballot box. So for all our talk about democracy, which we could think of as the popular will, they don't really believe in it, right? They intend to enact their programs for America with or without your support or your blessing. And they're also very frank and honest about how they want to use demographic shifts to accomplish this. Bring in millions of new voters who will vote left and through demographics, older, more conservative voters dying off and uh, younger, more conservative voters having fewer kids. So they're not shy about, about saying this, that, uh, you know, Oprah said something to the effect that we have to wait for some of these older white people to die uh, to, to eliminate racism, right? So I think this is, you know, one of the interesting hallmarks of today's left is that they're not seeking consensus with you. They intend to do this one way or another. So... With that said, 
let's talk a little bit about the alt-right. The alt-right is sort of a new term of art that has come into being in the last year or two. Its origins have been ascribed to a couple of different bloggers. I'm not sure exactly who owns it. But the thing to understand about the alt-right is that they are conservatives, but they're not part of the Republican Party. They're not part of the right-wing establishment in this country. They're certainly very anti-establishment. They hate people like Kasich. They hate organs like National Review and they hate neoconservative organs like the Weekly Standard, for example. So really, the alt-right is, is very much defined uh, by what it's against. There's not a natural home in a certain publication for the alt-right per se. You can find certainly alt-right thinking in a website like Breitbart, which is a very high-traffic right-wing website. But really, the alt-right finds its home primarily in social media, especially on Twitter. There are some alt-right people who are very active on Twitter and who have managed to advance a narrative using social media without any kind of mainstream publication behind them. One interesting thing about the alt-right is that they skew much younger. Traditional conservatives really are dying out. The left is right about that. Whereas alt-right people tend to skew younger, more millennials, and they're certainly more active on some of the newer platforms. One hallmark of the alt-right is populism. Populism combined with nationalism, right? Unlike the left, the alt-right says that it's okay to have a uniquely American identity and that America's past is not necessarily and inherently shameful. Uh, there are certainly things that are regrettable, but by and large, America is a good place and a great country. And I think one of the great things about the populism we see in the alt-right is there's a suspicion of elites, right? Which I think is always a healthy thing because most elites in this country became elite through nefarious state-connected means. So to the extent the alt-right is hostile to elites, I think we should welcome that. Now, where the alt-right parts with libertarianism rather abruptly is, is that the alt-right tends to be non-ideological. And they look at libertarianism with great suspicion because they don't like the idea of uh, ideological movements. They're more interested in identity politics like the left. On the issue of borders, the alt-right certainly disagrees with the left and with many libertarians. Uh, they think that we should have limited or no immigration into America, certainly not Islamic immigration. Now, on culture and Christianity and religion, you really start to see the split between the old right and the new emerging alt-right. I would say the alt-right is culturally Christian. But they're not animated by Christianity in the same way that the religious right or the pro-life right is. They don't believe in this sort of weak, simpering Christianity that has taken root in America, this turn-the-other-cheek Christianity, this Christianity that says we have to welcome immigrants from third-world countries. So while the alt-right is certainly not pro-abortion, and while the alt-right is certainly sympathetic to Christianity, it's more of a cultural Christianity rather than an evangelical or a Zionist Christianity. Now, this distinction between what we might call cultural Christianity and evangelical Christianity shows itself, reveals itself also in the alt-right's view towards foreign policy, right? The alt-right is much more in the Pat Buchanan camp of an America first type foreign policy. The alt-right is tired of endless and intractable wars in the Middle East. And, and, and I think most people on the alt-right feel like we shouldn't be expending American blood and treasure to save Iraq or any other country, Syria, in the Middle East. So in that sense, there's some room for agreement between libertarians on foreign policy. But there's less room for agreement, certainly, between the alt-right and libertarians on economic issues. The alt-right is openly protectionist, while suspicious of central banking, not necessarily clamoring to end the Fed. And I think what's most importantly here is the alt-right is not made up of free market ideologues, right? They believe that there are other issues, the health of the nation, the identity of the nation that are more important than just dollars and cents or GDP. So to that end, they're openly protectionist. They believe that we ought to have uh, trade policies that benefit American workers at the expense of cheap imports. And they're not afraid to criticize right-wingers and libertarians as sort of these, uh, ec you know, deracinated economic actors who only care about the financial bottom line in our country. One thing that's very interesting to me about the alt-right and, and one thing that distinguishes them uh, from more traditional or mainstream conservatives is they're not afraid uh, 
of this identity politics game, right? Uh, the, the left considers most right wingers and certainly most alt writers as racist or xenophobic or homophobic or whatever it might be. And the alt right actually pushes back on this and says, look, identity politics is a two way street. And the fact that whites or white males have been marginalized and demonized in society gives us a rallying cry to mobilize uh, those white male voters, and we're not going to be apologetic about it. So in that sense, it is more honest and open and refreshingly so than mainstream conservatives has been because mainstream conservatives have uh, unfortunately fallen into this trap of accepting the premises of the left and trying to co-opt and, and talk about nonsensical statist programs about diversity and inclusion, et cetera. So in that sense, I think it's refreshing. And finally, you know, one last point I'll make about the alt-right. Is, is something they share with the socialist left in this country, which is that they are not really seeking consensus any longer, right? They're not trying to win people on the left. They're very much unafraid of being marginalized or called names. And I think a lot of this stems from the fact that alt-right people are younger and they've grown up in a political era where they don't feel like there's anything left to lose, right? Mainstream conservatism has utterly failed to stop the incremental march of progressivism throughout the 20th century. So for a lot of these younger people, the dream of a nice affordable house and no student loan debt and getting married and having kids and a white picket fence has really been blown up. It's blown up in their faces. And so they blame conservatives for not conserving this element of America. And so, you know, they're really ready to go to battle with the social justice warriors, and they're not afraid of it. They're not afraid to use coarser language or to be more strident and, and just admit it. So I think what's so interesting about the alt-right is that just like the far left, they're not trying to obtain consensus for their views. They're just trying to find an avenue for their views to prevail. So that being said, let me wrap up with just a few thoughts about what we can learn from all this. Now, a lot of people in libertarian circles feel that populism and demagoguery are always bad things. And, and maybe there's an element of truth to that, but is there anything good that libertarians can take from these two emerging movements? Let me give you a quote from Murray Rothbard on demagogues. This is from 1954, but it really reads perfectly today, and I think it especially applies to the Trump phenomenon. Quoting Murray, he says, It is a fashionable belief that an idea is wrong in proportion to its extremism. To the professional middle of the rotor, a species that has always found in abundance, the demagogue invariably comes as a nasty shock. For it is one of the most admirable qualities of the demagogue that he forces men to think, some for the first time in their lives. Out of the muddle of current ideas, both fashionable and unfashionable, he extracts some and pushes them to their logical conclusions, i.e. to extremes. He thereby forces people either to reject their loosely held views as unsound or to find them sound and pursue them to their logical consequences. Far from being an irrational force, then, the silliest of demagogues is a great servant of reason, even when he is mostly in the wrong. So I think that's a fantastic quote, and I think it, it tells us that there's something we can gain from the environment uh, that's brewing today in America behind this 2016 election. So just a few thoughts in conclusion. If we understand that the socialist left opposes what it sees as an unjust economic elite, and if we understand that the alt-right opposes what it sees as an unjust cultural elite, then maybe we can make some headway with both sides in arguing that you know these elites are to a large extent created and funded by the state. If you were to reduce the size and scope of the state in our lives, I would argue that you would reduce the power of both cultural and economic elites over the rest of us. So I think we ought to stand ready to make this point that we can ratchet down uh, some of this lack of social cohesion in society by reducing the state. And really, I think that we need to make the point and we need to make it more frequently and we need to make it better that the future is really what works versus what doesn't. Americans are not necessarily uh, ideological animals. So what we know about liberty and markets is that they work. What we know about the state and democracy is that they don't work. So since the state can't work, we ought to make the case to people that the solutions to our problems are 
are actually non-state solutions, right? The state can't remake the Middle East. It can't win wars. It, it can't pay entitlements and welfare much longer, particularly with the actuarial reality behind the Medicare Part D prescription drug benefit. And, and most of all, the state can't create social cohesion, right? In fact, you can only make the social disruption worse. So we don't necessarily need to convince people on either side who are hostile to liberty to become libertarians, but we need to explain to them how the state makes things worse. And more importantly, for our own self-interest, we need to focus on the process of unyoking ourselves from them, right? Because at the end of the day, I think that the alt-right and the progressive left represent far more of a cultural divide than they do a political divide. So I think what we need to explain to people and do a better job of explaining is that radical decentralization of political power may be the only way to save America from some sort of unpleasant and authoritarian future. So that being said, ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. 